Hey, we're talking finances today, and uh, once we're done uh, with the panel, uh, uh, one, I pray that for every single panel that we've done, uh, whether it's parenting or singles or marriage, I'm literally praying for freedom on the other side of this talk. Uh, I believe that some of, I think some of us, I'll say some of us, either here or online, are going through some of the things that uh, either they've gone through or going through, uh, and I, I believe by telling the story, you would realize you're not alone, uh, and that there would literally be freedom. I pray today for financial freedom, um, and that it would bless you. Uh, it's not about anything else but helping you uh, uh, on this journey of your Christianity. And so, um, Luigi, we're going to start with uh, Luigi, and uh, we're talking about being a generous person. And listen, generosity isn't just finances. Uh, it's giving love. It's giving time, right? We know that. It's, it's giving of yourself. And so, today we are talking finances, but again, I just want to reiterate, generosity is not just finances. But today, uh, we're talking about that. And uh, Luigi uh, and I, uh, we go way back. We actually went to Bible school together. And uh, one time, uh, we were driving down. It was up by Rochester, and we were driving down. And he said, hey, why don't you drive? It was his car. Uh, he had a Cadillac. <laughs> with the big trunk. Um, and he said, he said, why don't you drive? And I said, okay. And he fell asleep. And uh, we hit an, uh, some black ice. And the car spun, 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 spun. Like, went into the woods, like, around, like, missed every tree. And then uh, finally it stopped, and I'm like, <sighs> that's when I saw Jesus for the first time. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how he got saved. Um, and uh, so we've almost died together, so we go, we go way back. But uh, I have known you, I've known him personally, even, I mean, for the last 20, 25 years, uh, to be a generous person, and not just here at Saints, uh, or uh, on mission trips, or at the Legacy Center, uh, um, and even in, just in our talking, um, uh, over at NISM, uh, um, I, I've known that him to be a generous person, but what's funny is, it wasn't always like that for him, and so, real quick, tell us, tell us a, a little bit of your story. Yeah, so, I, I got saved, I was 21 years old, coming from an Italian background, and a friend of mine asked me to go to, a, to church with him, to a Christian church. So, my first experience in a Christian church blew my mind, because back then they didn't have electronic giving. So I remember sitting in the balcony of this very large church, and seeing large buckets of money pass by. And the first thing I said to myself was, how do I open one of these churches? So, <laughs> I said, I, I, I started counting how many people in here. I started, I figured, how do I open one of these? Because that's where my mind went right away. But, but also, I became very suspicious. Um, I remember he gave, the pastor gave an altar call, and I'm at the altar, and I'm saying, yes, Lord, I give my life to you. And in the right side of my peripheral vision, I'm looking at the pastor saying, this guy is a crook, but I'm going to serve Jesus. So that's where I came from, and it took a long road for the Lord to change my, my mind on that. But that's, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Yeah. And, and so, but now you, you've obviously gone from that to being this generous person. How, how does that, like, what did that do for you? Basically, it, I felt my life was being cut short. Uh, my wife is a very generous giver, and she would always... Uh, talk about generosity, and I felt like I was giving my, my life short. So I came to a turning point where I was like, Lord, you have to help me, because this is not in me to do this. I, I, you know, I'm suspicious. I, I, always feel, uh, uh, I always feel negative about everyone, and it was always uh, trying to hold back, but, but I prayed. And I got to tell you, just like uh, it says in Jabez, that it says that God, he prayed that God would extend his borders. My life today, I'm living and on borders that I don't have the ability to live in. Wow. God has extended my borders. I have peace, I have joy, I have protection. God has given me a beautiful family, and I gotta tell you, I'm living above my abilities today, and it's not because I'm smart, it's just because I decided to trust in him, and it changed my life. So good. Yeah. No, that's good, Luigi. Um, I love that you said that, it's, once again, we're not just sticking on the finances. You said you had peace, you had joy. Um, you can't just give and not reap that generosity. Absolutely. Amen? Absolutely. Can you talk a little bit more about what are some of the things that you've experienced in your life by giving unto others? Well, what, you know, 
Jesus said this. He says, if you have a shirt, two shirts, and your brother needs one, share it with that person. You don't hear many people talk about that, right? But I try to live by that rule. If I know there's a need, and there's somebody around me that I can bless or help them or be some, be some kind of a blessing to that person, I try to do that. And I try to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit because you can't possibly give to every need. So you have to, you have to listen and say, God, what are you doing? Because sometimes, you can, sometimes God will ask you to give more than what you're obligated to give. And because there's a need. But if you trust him and you listen to the Holy Spirit without destroying your own finances, God will lead you to give, um, uh, he will, um, give it in the right way without d d uh, damaging your own finances in a way that will bless you and bless the person that you're giving to. So good. Um, Carmen, uh, I don't know if you know this woman, uh, but this woman might be the most generous person I've ever met in my life. I have personally benefited from her generosity, um, and again, not just finances, but she, uh, she goes on mission trips with us. She's been to pretty much every Eswatini, everyone? Maybe not the first one, but... Not the um, almost every Eswatini mission trip, and if she sees a need, She's like, we've got to respond. We cannot leave this situation like this. We'll figure it out. She is at the Legacy Center five days a week, six in the morning. She beats me there. Does it get paid? 100% volunteer. She is at the Legacy Center five days a week. I don't know how many hours she puts in. She runs the whole thing. If I'm, if I'm gone, nobody even care, cares. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Man, what do I do there? <laughs> but if I'm gone, I know she misses me, but I am so secure that all those families are going to get served and loved and fed. Uh, Wednesdays are gonna get done. She's gonna make it happen. And I'm just, uh, I just love this woman. Somebody give it up for Carmen real quick. <laughs> and what I love about her is she gives and never complains. Carmen, why do you give, why do you not complain? So I give because that's what the word says. God's word says that we should give. And we know that. But do we really get it? So before I gave my life to the Lord, I used to go to church with my friend. And I would put money in an offering and say, check, I did that. And then I gave my life to the Lord and I struggled with tithing. And I wondered why I was cheating God. He never cheated me. Even when I wasn't serving him, he brought me through so many valleys. And I started reading the scriptures and I felt convicted. Um, and this is personal, right? I'm not judging anyone, but I was thinking he's been there helping me through everything. But I was thinking, wow, that's a lot of money. I could buy a new car. I could have better clothes. I could buy more shoes. And I was just thinking worldly things. I wasn't thinking about um, the Lord. And so I started going on mission trips because I thought I knew what it was to be without, but I really didn't. And going on mission trips, I seen the need. Serving at the Legacy Center, watching people wait online for hours to get food. And so I didn't really know what the need was or what to be, you know, to be without. And so I seen it. And I, I, don't, I, I don't even know, I don't even know what to say. It's, it's just like God started nudging and tugging on my heart 
and it was persistent. And, and so how could I not give? Everything that I have belongs to Jesus, and he gave it to me. And God, I have never, my lifestyle has never changed from, from being obedient to his word. And I never went without anything, and I just know that everything that he's given me, he's been blessing it and multiplying it for me to help someone else. So generosity is not about just money. It's about your time. It's about um, serving uh, unconditionally, selfless, just being there for that person. It could be a lunch date. It could be going to the hospital and sitting with someone whose parent is in their last stages dying. It could be um, helping someone move, reorganizing their house. We have skills and talents that God gifted us with, and we're to use them to help someone else. And so, Pastor Jordan, that's why I do it. Amen. That's good. Uh, you know, you, you said a lot, Carmen, and when, when we give unto God, when we give out of obedience to God, there are no regrets. There really isn't. Once you get a true understanding, because God said it, and all you're getting, get understanding. And when you understand something, there's not an opposition. There will be, but you easily step over that because you know, God, when I'm giving unto you or when I'm giving to your people or those in need, I know, Father God, I'm doing your will. And check this out. Whenever a crisis happens, the world turns to the church. They really do. And we are supposed to be blessed to be a blessing. So when people see, they, it, we get a bad image on tithing and offering, but we understand, but a lot of people don't think it. They see it as a money grab. That's why I appreciate Luigi's transparency because people see it as that, but we know that, oh no, God, we're honoring you. And in return, Lord, you are gonna bless us. And in that, like Luigi said, we can bless others. There are people who aren't gonna have homes. I've been in a situation where I didn't have a place to stay and somebody, another believer, was able to let me stay with them. We gotta be in that position, y'all. And through that, we have influence. And influence leads people to Christ. Amen? Amen. So in that, I want to just say, we have to be obedient, right? We're not just being careless. We are being good stewards over our finances. So I love that you said that. And, and, and so there are no regrets. So I actually want to talk about that with both of y'all. How has that been for you all, giving unto God, giving to others, and feeling no regret? Can we talk a little bit about that? Sure. <clears throat> I didn't know if it was for common or for myself. But, um, but it, it's, it's, we have to come to the realization that we are God's answer for the world, right? We are the body of Christ. God doesn't send angels. He doesn't uh, send money uh, automatically. We are God, the solution for people's problems, okay? And if, and, and if there's one thing that I wish that I can give you, which is something you have to learn on your own, is I wish I could impart to you the blessing that you receive when you serve God, how he keeps everything in your life in order, okay? It's not something that I can give you. It's something that you have to do on your own. And you have to do it by a step of faith, by trusting him, by being generous, and take a step of faith and be generous with your, with your neighbor, with the person sitting next to you, with the body of Christ, especially the body of Christ. And I'll tell you why. I'm going to say this, maybe a little selfish, but I'm going to say this. My generosity mostly focuses on the body of Christ. Why? Because whenever I give to my brother or my sister or somebody in this church, I'm giving it to Jesus directly. Because God identifies with his people. We are his body. And so I have, I have learned, especially before anyone else, I'm going to bless the body of Christ. And that has opened so many blessings in my life. Not, in, not only financially, but the family that I have built in this church has is, is revolutionized my life. So that's what I would encourage everyone today. That, that's what it's done for me. I love that, Luigi. Amen. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about different series that we have coming up you know, throughout the year, and, and uh, finance is a big one. And, 
And it's not just, we, we want to help people because there's some people that don't know how to budget and have issues with um, literally just budgeting your finances and what does that look like? And okay, I get paid this much and I've got all these bills and uh, at least I know for me, I have, I have a budget. I have tons of notes on my phone and the first one's giving and I, I know what I've decided to give and so that's at the top and then, then I subtract from there and this is how much money and I got this bill, this bill, this bill, this bill, this bill. And if something doesn't fit, then something comes out of there. Something doesn't come out of my first part, which is the giving part. It's, this is not the part that's expendable or subtractable. This part is, do, all right, I can't afford Netflix, or I can't afford Hulu, I can't afford the, the Starbucks, or I can't afford, that's where this comes, this gets cut. This part doesn't get cut. Because when this part gets cut, actually this part gets cut. That's it. The, the Bible says that uh, the, the land of the generous gets larger and larger, but the land of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. And so uh, I'm going to make sure that the giving, that's why even, even talking about our finances, and we'll have a couple financial Sundays and talk about budgeting, and I pray that it helps somebody. Uh, but we start off with the giving, because if we don't start off with the giving, then the other part doesn't even come into play. And so uh, we want to encourage you. We want to encourage you to be generous with your, your finances, with your time, with your talents. Um, um, and, and, uh, and bless others. And something that uh, Luigi had said we were talking uh, before is that it encourages, when you give, it encourages other people to give. Yes. I, I look at an Amanda who, who was just blessed. I, I believe that because of that moment, she's going to be more giving because she's like, man, look out. Um, and so uh, I pray that I pray that some of uh, the things that were said, uh, this is a shorter one. We're going to allow uh, Pastor Durso to come up and and preach. Uh, but I pray that that uh, that on the other side of this talk and on the other side of what Pastor Durso shares, that there is a financial freedom, financial freedom. I actually believe there are financial chains uh, on some of us uh, in this room. And I believe that after today, those chains are gonna break. I'm, I'm believing that they're going to fall off of our wrists and that it's going to open up our mind and it is going to bless you. It is going to bless you. I'm believing for that. So would you help me welcome our pastor on his birthday? <laughs> Let's put our hands together for the panel. Come on. So we had Luigi and Carmen Dominici. Uh, I don't understand. I have my whole family up here. I can't believe it got to a place like this. I love the series that we've done, all of them. I really have, and uh, all the work that went into Pastor Jordan and Elisha and uh, the people that were willing to just kind of share. Um, these are the practical things. You know, there's, there's a spiritual part of Christianity, then there's a practical. And when you read the epistles, you see a lot of that. And so this is one of them about being generous because I can hopefully share with you how the people of God, Old and New Testament, were generous people. And it was supposed to be an example of us because it's a culture that you're trying to create or that we're trying to create. And culture is intentional. It's what you prioritize. It's your values that you put up front that will create culture. And, uh, and then hopefully that culture will be attractive to others. And uh, they've been mentioning that it's not just money. That's true. It's time. It's talent. Uh, when I think of all the work that goes into this place here, that's not directly... Uh, connect with money, but uh, time, it's amazing. So I'm going to share some of that because it's about the heart. It's about the heart. You know, Jesus said that where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And, uh, you know, if, if your heart is about the things of God, then you're going to invest your treasure, whether it's time or talent or, or monies. Um, so I want to give you a list of, of, of some people that were very generous with the scriptures. I, we'll get it on, on, on the screen so you can write it. And you know what? I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to look at these scriptures and see for yourself what the scriptures are saying. Let the Holy Spirit, the Berean Christians in Acts 17 search the scriptures to see if Paul and Silas was telling them the truth. That's what I want you to do. 
Let the Holy Spirit guide you and lead you. To begin with, listen, there's no more generous person than God, right? Uh, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he what? He gave. So when we give, we're very much like God. In fact, as we give, we're, uh, we're likened to God. And I never want us to be selfish about that. So the first place I'm going to look is in Genesis 14, where Abe, Abraham uh, found out that his nephew Lot, who left him, went to go live in Sodom. And then these four kings, these four armies, attacked Sodom and Gomorrah and other surrounding cities. And when they attacked them, they took people captive. They either killed them or took them captive. And Lot and his family was taken captive. But not just Lot and his family, but all the resources, the herds, uh, the, the, the produce, the monies, the gold, the wine, everything that those cities had, these four uh, armies confiscated and took with them. And when Lot, when Abraham found out that Lot was captured, he took 318 men raised in his house, which is important, raised in his house to go fight these, these four armies. And they won the victory. There, here, think about this. Talk about dedicating or being uh, generous with your time and your talent. These men were risking their lives uh, to go rescue Lot. And when they beat these four armies, they headed back towards where they lived, and they came to a place uh, where they ended up meeting a king and a priest named Melchizedek. And Melchizedek greeted them with oil, uh, with uh, bread and wine, to bless them. And then it, by, the Bible says in 1420, and Abram gave a tenth a tithe of everything that he had. Let's not focus in on the tithe right now. Let's just focus in on the generosity. He gave someone an incredible blessing that didn't even fight for the army, that wasn't with him uh, uh, spending any time doing it. He just blessed him. That's, uh, in fact, uh, Elisha referred to it. God blessed Abraham so that he could be a blessing. God blesses us so that we can be a blessing. And it's not whether or not someone has contributed or not. It's when God puts it on your heart to do that, to be generous. A another aspect is in 1 Kings 17, where there's the widow of Zarephath. And there was a famine in the land, a drought. And the prophet Elijah goes to this woman who was picking up sticks to make a fire and says, please bring me a glass of water, which would be fine in any other situation, but it was during a drought. Water was a, an incredible commodity. And he says, bring me a glass of water. She says, okay. Then he says, and while you're at it, make me a cake, make me bread. This is in a drought. And she says, uh, sir, I only have a handful of flour and a little bit of oil, and I'm going to make my last meal for me and my son, and we're going to die. Talk about being in a desperate situation. And Elijah said, well, go do what you said, but bring me first the cake. That would sound so selfish. But this woman did that. She brought him the cake first, and for three and a half years, this woman had food, but nobody else did. As, as Luigi was saying before, when you serve God, when you give to God, God always repays you back one way or another. He provided for this woman when no one else had provision. Then in 2 Kings 4, there was a, a woman, not a widow, in fact, a wealthy woman, because generosity doesn't really depend on whether you're poor or rich. So it's, 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 it's another value. It's something that, uh, uh, that God works in your heart. Well, in 2 Kings 4, the, this woman, the, a Shemanite woman, knew that Elisha, Elijah's protege, Elisha, was traveling back and forth, and she sensed that this was a man of God. Almost like what Luigi was saying, there's times you just sense things. And uh, she didn't want him to sleep out in the field or maybe in an inn. In those days, inns were dangerous places. So she said to us, well, let's build an extension to our home. And let's put in a table and a chair and a bed and a lamp so that when he comes this way, he has a place to stay. Talk about generosity. You know, it's one thing to give somebody money. It's another thing to give them your home or at least part of your home. But, but it, it helps us understand that when it comes to God's people, there should be that, that quality in us that we're willing to give even when it costs us. Classic, Luke 10. Good Samaritan. Now, I'm sure many of you know that the Samaritan and the Jews really hated each other. And this one particular Jew was lying, got mugged, beat up. It was probably in New York somewhere. Got beat up and <laughs> left for dead. And the Samaritan, who, like I said, there was real friction between these two cultures. The Samaritan sees the guy beaten up and bleeding. What he does is he stops, puts oil and wine on the wounds which is antiseptic, puts the man on his donkey, 
takes the man to an inn, pays in advance the inn for the man to stay there and tells the innkeeper, if, I, if this is not enough, when I come back, I'll give you the rest. He just helps someone. And listen, get this, as important as it is to pray, sometimes you don't have to pray. Sometimes you need to react. Because he didn't, he didn't, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you to that one person. But anyway, <laughs> stop, I don't have enough time. Um, he, he recognized he saw a need, so he responded. I'm all for praying. And there are times you do have to pray to make sure you don't just end up hurting yourself. But sometimes you just got to give. Sometimes you just got to respond. And that's exactly what the Good Samaritan did. What about the widow in, in, in uh, Mark 12? She was in the temple. And all these people are putting tons of money. That didn't attract, that didn't get Jesus' attention. The widow did. She had two mites or two pennies. And says, but that's all she had. That's generosity. You know, to give, you know, when you hear some of these very wealthy people, and there's nothing wrong with being wealthy, you know, make these donations to charities, uh, maybe a million dollars here or another million dollars there, but they got billions. That's not really costing them anything. But this widow, she was generous with all that she had. There's an indication of generosity. There's an indication of really believing God and putting God first. And then in Luke 8, it tells us about women that followed after Jesus and supported his ministry. Now, what you got to remember, these women were Jews. So they were still tithing. They had to, according to the law. They had to do the temple tax. But they were now giving above and beyond the tithe and the temple tax to support Jesus' ministry. And, and, and they felt they wanted to make investment. Why? Because that's where their heart was. The heart was in, is in the ministry of what Jesus was, and she supported him. John 19, Joseph Amathea, wealthy guy, gives Jesus his tomb to be buried in. And you can't forget about Mary who poured a, a pound of ointment over Jesus a, worth a year's salary because their heart was for Jesus. This kind of generosity it just runs throughout the Bible, and not just in the Gospels. In the book of Acts, in the fourth chapter, it says that the disciples, the people of God, the followers of Jesus, were selling lands and houses and bringing the money to the apostles for the work of the Lord. In fact, we, we heard about Barnabas a, a couple of times in these series. His real name was Joseph. He was from Cyprus. He was a Levite. He sold some property and gave it to the, the work of the Lord. There's this kind of generosity where people are willing to even sell some of the investments they've made to help the kingdom. So it's, 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 it's an attitude that really God's got to work in us because the tendency for us is to be selfish. One of the first uh, words children learn is mine, right? <laughs> Takes them, that's mine, that's mine. You don't have to teach them to say that. Sort of, it's innate, it's part of this sinful nature. But uh, that's what we have to be so conscious about, asking God to help us. 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, talks about the Macedonian church, which is another poor church. In fact, they were very poor, and, and they actually begged to give money to the saints in Jerusalem. And they never met the saints in Jerusalem. But see, when you have a spirit of generosity, like Luigi was saying in common, when you see people hurting and in need, you want to give. You know, I, with confidence... Um, with Eswatini, uh, I've been there three times on, on, on the trips, and, but there's over 100 people in this church that have been to Eswatini with the mission trips, at least. So it's not like we're just putting up a picture of some children with tears in their eyes to get you to give money. We've been there. We've been on the ground. We know what's there. So when we're generous to a place like that, you know, we all have running water in our homes. We have heat. We have electricity. Nine out of ten of those children do not have that. And they're most likely not living with their parents because their parents probably died from AIDS and they're living with their grandparents. That tends to be what I've saw there many times. And then, of course, there was the church at Philippi who was supporting Paul while he was in a prison in Rome. God wants, I believe, his church to be a generous church. But a generous church can only be a generous church if the people that go to that church is generous. And again, uh, it's with our time, with our talents. Do you know that for a Sunday to happen, there's a, a host of people that come here at 7 o'clock in the morning and stay to about 3 in the afternoon. 
to make sure the lights are on, the heat's on, the air conditioning's on, the sound is working, the songs are working, uh, the, the buildings are getting clean, there's culinary, there's people watching our children, holding our babies, teaching our kids. It's giving your time. It's all part of being a generous church with our talents, with our, with our time, with our, with our monies, so that we can do what we're supposed to do in this particular part of the vineyard. Whether rich or poor, it doesn't really matter. The, the, the widow in First Kings, she was poor. Uh, the, the, the Macedonian church, they were poor. The widow in the temple, they were poor, but they gave. They understood, obviously, the spirit of generosity so that the work of the Lord can continue. And like I said, a church, to be generous, has to be made up of people that, um, that is generous. And um, when you put Jesus first in your life, and again, I keep going back to Luigi. I'm sorry, brother, but both you and Carmen did so well up here. When you put Jesus first in your life, he will work in your life to become generous because he was generous. Romans 8, 29 says that he's conforming us into the image of Christ. And Jesus was very generous. And so when we allow him to be first, first and foremost, really first, well, then that begins to work in our lives. And uh, I, I know I can speak for my wife and I that that's the reason why we give to the work of the Lord. That's why we do what we do. And, um, you know, whenever the Bible talks about something the first time in the scriptures, you've heard us say this before, it's probably the, the most purest teaching or understanding of what it's referring to the first time. And... Um, it's a priority. We, on the first Wednesday of every month, we have a prayer. Well, we have a prayer meeting every Wednesday, but we fast and pray on, on a Wednesday. Why? Because it's a priority for us. We're meeting on the first day of the week. Monday's not the first day of the week. That's the business end of it. But the spiritual end is Sunday. That's the first day of the week. We meet on it because it sets a priority. We're saying, God, you're first in our lives. And so that's why we meet. That's why we celebrate. And, 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 and when, we, when we give to God, when, we, when we're generous, we want to give God the first fruits or the first part of our lives, the best we have, so that we can do what God calls us to do. The first family, in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, it talks about giving. Genesis 4.3. It says this, One day Cain, this is one of the sons of Adam and Eve, Cain, gave a part, please notice, gave a part of his, har of his harvest to the Lord. Remember, most of the Old Testament, the society was agricultural. Also in the new, but especially in the old. And they were either farmers or herdsmen. And so they didn't have dollar bills or coins like we do at the time. They dealt with produce. They dealt with herds. And it says here, one day Cain gave a part of his harvest to the Lord. Fourth verse, and Abel, who's his brother, also gave an offering to the Lord. He killed the firstborn. What does that say? He didn't wait till he had a second lamb to offer. He gave his first. First is the, is, is the main word here. He gave his firstborn lamb uh, from one of his sheep and gave the Lord the best parts of it. He didn't give a hoof or a tail. He gave those eye round lamb chops. He, he really did something best for the Lord. That was a joke. You're supposed to laugh at that. I thought that was pretty clever on my part because I love lamb chops. But he gave, he gave God the best and he, and he put God first. And when, when it comes to generosity, we have to recognize when it comes to the things of God, we should be giving our talents and our time and our monies to the kingdom of God. And if, if this is not your church, well, don't do it here. Do it with the church that you belong to. But you should belong to some church. I mean, you know, otherwise you're just kind of, you'll, you'll never really grow. And that's a whole other topic. But, you know, Solomon, who had a lot of money, obviously, says in Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord with your wealth and the best part of everything you produce. It's an attitude of generosity. It's God first in, in everything. I remember the first time uh, we... We, we learned tithing from the very beginning when we got saved back in, in, 70, in 75. But we visited a church one time, maybe a little time after that, and the pastor was saying, there's 100 people here that want to give $100. Now, this is in 75, 1975. And my wife stood up. I said, what? 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 $100? Are you kidding? Sit down. Girl, sit down. Sit down.
But that's because Maria is very, very generous. She's always giving things away, you know? What happened to our car? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but when you allow God to work in your life and you put him first, you tend to be generous. You tend to think of others even before yourself. Not that you hurt yourself. Not that you hurt yourself, but you think of others. And um, when, it, when, when it comes to tithing, as Carmen mentioned earlier, a little side note on that. Marie and I believe in tithing. Um, we believe 10%, first fruits, gross, off the top, goes to God. This is what we believe. Uh, do I check if you tithe? No, I do not. I don't want to know unless you feel you have to tell me. Um, that's between you and God. Uh, we teach on it. I teach on it. Just like we teach on prayer. Now, I don't ask if you pray every day. I think you should. But I leave that between you and God. We teach on reading God's word um, every day, I believe. So like the manna that fell every day, fresh. You need a fresh word of God. But I don't inspect that on you. I just teach it. And if you ask me about it, I'll tell you what I believe. But I'm not going to examine whether or not you get up at a certain time to read and pray. And the same with tithing. I teach it. I believe it. Um, we've been doing it from when we first got saved. Um, but that's between you and God. And if you would ask me about tithing, being that Carmen referred to it, well, that, that's 10%. And that comes from, from, from the scriptures. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 16, when Paul was telling the church at Corinth, which is in Greece, and the church is from Galatia, which is where modern Turkey is today, he says, set aside a sum of money according to your income. How do you determine what's according to your income unless you have some, some metrics to work from? And so I believe that's what the tithe comes in. The 10% helps us to understand that. And, and, and Jesus, as some explained, was the firstborn, and he was kind of God's tithe to us. And um, it's, it, to me, it runs throughout the scriptures. Yeah, well, you know what, Pastor Durso, there's nowhere in the New Testament it says to tithe. Well, Jesus refers to tithing in Matthew 23, 23, when he was talking to the religious leaders. And um, he was saying, you know, you worry about a tithe on a mint and your, your crops, which you should. Yes, you should tithe. He says it specifically. Yes, but you need to worry about kindness and justice and faith. So he's rebuking them. But he wasn't saying to stop tithing. Um, and then, of course, if you read Hebrews 7, where it talks about Melchizedek and Jesus being a type, goes back to Genesis 14, where Abram gave Melchizedek a tithe of everything. To me, all those things connect. Because to me, the Bible is not old or new. The Bible is old and new. And some things overlap. Generous generous worship. I believe we have that. Um, we demonstrated that, that a little while ago. The Bible, Old Testament, tells us to shout, to, to dance. Nowhere in the New Testament to tell you to dance. We're a clapping church. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, we clap on everything, you know. The meeting's over. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Nowhere in the New Testament to tell you to clap. But we clap. It says in the Old Testament, but not the New Testament. No one in the New Testament to tell you to have musicians and singers. I'm so grateful for these men and women that we have here. But no one in the New Testament tells you to have that. But we have that. Some things just carry over. And that's what Marie and I believe about tithing. We believe it just carries over. We, that's how the church can, can be sustained. I love, I love uh, my son uh, Jordan's uh, um, teaching when he says, what happens in this moment, the offering, makes everything else happen. I so appreciate people who tithe because tithers are consistent, whether it's their time, whether it's their talent, whether it's their money, and enables us, as he said, to do what we do. Um, because if we didn't have them, we couldn't afford to be able to uh, 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 keep up the Legacy Center or Eswatini or even what we do here. So it, it, it's a matter of the heart of, you know, what, what, do you, what do you want to be generous in? Do you want to be generous in your time? Do you want to be generous? You know, I think of the singers here. They sing for what, maybe 20, 25 minutes? But it's hours of rehearsal and practice. You know, so they're being generous with their time. You know, and, and, and so it's a matter of understanding the kingdom of God is usually built by generous people with their monies, with their time, with their talent. And it's just a matter of saying, well, you know what, God, I, I want that spirit. I want to be generous. I want to be generous in all those areas. And... um. 
You have a right, I have a right to believe whatever we want. But it doesn't mean that whatever we believe is right. In fact, St. Augustine, who we take that quote from every saint as a past, he said that if you only believe what you like in the scriptures and reject what you don't like, you don't believe the scriptures. You believe yourself. And that's always pretty dangerous. I don't want to believe in myself. I want to believe in the scriptures.